Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream on the 20th of September 2022. Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics here. Great to have you on and thanks very much for spending some of your Tuesday evening with us. I have Tony ready to come in, but just before I bring him in, I will remind you, as I always do, that we don't provide specific financial or legal advice on the channel. This is a general conversation only. The chat room is being moderated so please uh, just bear that in mind but I do encourage you to make comments and have conversations in the chat this is as at the 20th of September 2022 if you're watching in replay please use at walk the world if you want to ask a question and get my attention because there's always plenty going on in the chat and I may not pick it all up but if you use at walk the world it comes into my stream and queue and that means I can manage it better I've also enabled super chat which means that if you want to get your question top of the list, you can do that. Or indeed, if you'd like to make a contribution to what we do here. And uh, just uh, say um, thanks to James for his um, coffee money even before we started. It really is uh, appreciated, James. So thank you very much. OK, with that, I'm going to push this button. Tony, are you there? I'm here, Martin. And good evening to this wonderful, wonderful community. It's uh, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's great to have you back on again. And I was looking at just just under two months ago that we were last on, and things have well, they've you know got a bit worse, I guess, over the last couple of months. Yeah, actually, I was I was thinking, what a terrible time to be alive. Really, uh, there's just no precedent for what what we're seeing. And coming out of COVID, and then interest rates back in April was zero point one. And now suddenly they're 2.35 on their way to some form of normalisation. We've got that to contend with. Uh, the Queen just passed away. A lot of other people I've grown up and admired over the year, years have passed away as well. And it just feels like uh, being sandpapered to death on, on steroids and knock that off your Lacantro bingo card. But, <laughs> wow, guys, it's this is... This is scary shit. Um, I've, I've, you know, I've been a police officer formally for eight years. I saw a lot of stress, domestic violence. Look, I can say that there's no greater stress than financial stress. And I've, I'm absolutely petrified as to what's going to happen. I think we're going to see rampant protests. I think we'll see people push trolleys into Woolworths and trolley out with a trolley full of meat. I just think this thing's only starting. And the beautiful thing is that this channel and your well-esteemed guests, Martin, have, have been warning people. Admittedly, things the stupidity's gone on a little bit longer than what <laughs> we expected. But now it's every family for themselves. Sandbag your finances. Make sure you can handle what's coming because it's, it's only just begun. And I look over to Canada. You know, Justin Trudeau's been, they've taken the piss out of him for singing Bohemian Rhapsody. Easy come, easy go. It's a bit like the Canadian housing market, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah, and my slideshow will reiterate that. And look, there's a bit to be happy about. We've got the AFL Grand Final on Saturday. We've got Melbourne Cup Day to drown out that 50 basis point rise. But, uh, geez, what an interesting time to be alive. And future economic student, students and aliens are going to laugh at us for generations. Absolutely, Terry. Yeah, it's certainly a very interesting time. And, uh, you know, with all of these things, um, who knows what's going to happen next. But um, you mentioned your slides, and uh, I know what we're going to do, I think, this evening is to get you to go through your slides, first of all, not least because yeah. <laughs> they're pretty flash, but also because I think it sets up the uh, evening's conversation pretty well. So I'll give you... Um, the control of the screen and yeah, then you can sure. carry on okay so that's me um there's my email address if you want to reach out to me that's great i just i just thought uh quite a bit has hit me this year but i thought it'd be worthwhile um i saw a tweet from roger brown and um yeah it, it, i was hurt it was hurt um i, I felt some sadness I think it's worth playing a couple of Roger's greatest hits because I think there'll never be a person like Roger. And, um, yeah, I don't – look, I normally can hold in my emotions, but uh, anyway. I mean, that, that's the tweets end or tweets. Uh, you know, what 
what people out there have the courage to tweet something like that? And look, it's scary. People might think it's over the top, but what if Roger's only half right? Uh, that one, interesting. Again, you know, a lot of intelligence in these tweets delivered with, uh, with a brutal message. Uh, this one, if you look back to November last year, I think he called that absolutely spot on where you could you could take out a five-year fixed mortgage. Uh, my five-year was close to that rate. And to make that brave call that they're going to hit 6% by the end of this year, I mean, that's that's just foresight beyond what a lot of people would have been thinking. And, uh, you know, spot on, Roger. And, um, and again, you know, Roger talks about speculation. And, um, yeah, sadly, that was a tweet that um, was heart-wrenching for me. And I just thought it was a good idea to, to give Roger the lead off to this program because I'd like to thank Roger for what he's contributed to Twitter, to this community. And we need more people with the courage to be able to come out, you know, speak their mind and not fear any retribution. But so far, oh, God, guys, I just hope that Roger isn't 100% spot on because, yeah, anyway. Anyway, so um, all the best, Roger. I hope you're doing well at the moment. There's the disclaimer. Um, that cow will revisit us shortly. That's just basically to say that it's it's general. I'm not providing advice. All I'm doing is trying to be honest uh, and tell you how it is. I will discuss later some areas of the market where I, I think that can be profitable amongst what we're going through. So read that at your own leisure, moving right along. Well, that's where we're heading. Um, I don't think there's no two ways about it. The old uh, soccer mum SUVs get swept up in the storm, uh, housing market on fire, stock market. Uh, I, I don't think there's any other way to put it. Uh, what we've got coming is rates that, as I said, were 0.1 now 2.35, talks are peaking at 3.6. That gets towards mortgage rates between 6 and 7%. So someone you know, with a $1 million mortgage is looking at $100,000 a year, principal and interest repayments on an asset that's going to halve. Um, to me, yeah, well, that's just a mild case of being sandpapered to death. But anyway, I have had the help of a graphic designer uh, my aim with these slides is to polarise, so. Okay, so on, on the headlines now, we've had Lowe, who's come out with a massive call, and he says 10%. Uh, uh, well, I'll say good luck with that. I think a lot of areas are already down 10% uh, at least. I, I've been looking at a lot of the tweets and Cookie's information, and we're seeing uh, the... Borkham Hills, Pennant Hills area, Kellyville, all under enormous pressure at the moment. That will, I know that um, in the Telegraph, they were talking about Northern Beaches being uh, bulletproof. You know, bulletproof real estate is a bigger oxymoron than a plant-based bacon treat. I don't know, they're absolutely kidding themselves on that. So that's the headlines we've got to put up with. Uh, Baron Joey have come out and tipped uh, 25%. I think that's more like it. We've got Chris Joy, similar. Uh, Morgan Kelly says, he's the famous Irish economist, says that during every OCD housing bubble, you lose 70% of your gains. So let's just say uh, the bubble goes from 600,000 to 1.7 you're going to lose 70% of that 1.1 million gain. So, you know, there is an argument as to how much of that will be lost. But he said that he'd studied every major OECD housing bubble. And to me, this looks like a generic off-the-shelf housing bubble into a period of rates increasing with extreme leverage. So, again, economic shitstorm right ahead. Uh, so based on all these forecasts, I've, I came out and said, oh, look, 40 to 50% off uh, Sydney. So if you look at a 1.7 median, that's a pretty hefty decline. 
And I'd be looking for a headline in the Daily Telegraph, uh, which will read no longer the Million Dollar City uh, with a picture of the Opera House. So again, you know, that, that's the situation. And I think in once a bubble starts to deflate, burst, suddenly an ocean view isn't worth that much. Just think about staring out to water. Uh, any house in uh, you know outer western Sydney, East Dubbo, uh, it, it looked like a lot of the people out there, some some of them anyway, would be customers of Walter White. Um, I just think every every house in a in a city becomes a blue chip investment. You're getting towards the top of that, and again, once the borrowing capacity is reduced. That's the fuel on the fire. And suddenly you'll start to see prices roll over. Again, we still haven't looked at the investors yet to panic. Those, the flippers yet to panic. Uh, those trying to renovate have been thwarted by a lack of tradies, a lack of supplies. So it's an absolute perfect storm, so to speak. But that situation surely looks ugly. And when you've got Baron Joey saying 25%, I think it's going to be much worse than that, but it will be. It might might take a while to unfold. And if you look you look at Canada, which they have a very similar economy to ours, you also look at New Zealand. Prices off a cliff there. And I I go back to Morgan Kelly's interviews on Ireland. He said, "Well, Ireland is going to fall fifty percent." Morgan Kelly was spot on. But I have been reading some tweets on the likes of Phoenix, Arizona, and some other areas that were the the barometer of the U.S. housing crash, and I think those areas again are going to suffer. So this is this is going to be this is going to be global, guys. And I think that Lowe's ten percent call is almost as good as the as the no interest rate rises before twenty twenty four. But I'll give it to I'll give it to him. He said uh, plausible. So. So, look, I don't like to be uh, one direction. I, I think that out of all this, there's going to be a number of opportunities. So where I like to base my investments, obviously in precious metals, uh, gold, gold and silver, I'm of the firm view that dollar cost averaging silver would, would be my preferred strategy. I try and get my kids to do it as much as possible. Gold, gold stocks have been hammered. The gold price price is now below 1700. It's still holding up in, in Aussie dollars. But what I do is I identify gold explorers that are working up towards a resource. And that, that is where the real upside is, is in the gold exploration companies. I won't mention any now, but that's where you get your uplift because if you find a million ounces of gold, your market cap generally can trade between 60 and $100 million for that. And there is going to be some corporate activity in the gold sector. I've been covering gold stocks since 1998. And I remember back when the US gold price was $251 an ounce, we still had a vibrant gold sector. And that means that the cost of production obviously was below that. But now you've got rampant inflation. Fuel costs are about to explode, wages and supply issues. So the gold producers at the moment are struggling, but hopefully once inflation pressures ease with these successful rate increases, uh, Aussie producers should have, should have a bit of a tailwind there. Copper is my favourite base metal. Already we're seeing BHP launch a bid for Oz Minerals. That is to not only get control of some copper resources, it is also to make Olympic Dam work. Olympic Dam has never really lived up to its potential. So BHP are looking at synergies. I recommended a little copper stock to my clients only weeks ago, Demetallica, and already uh, AIC Mines has launched a takeover, takeover offer for them. Again, to secure 9 million tonnes of copper resource. So I see a massive future for copper juniors. They have been poleaxed. And you should remember that a lot of the world's copper is 4,000 metres above sea level and the grades are under 1%. So 
So I, again, I am accumulating copper juniors for clients. I would expect that sector to get some attention. Uh, the biotech sector has been absolutely beaten up. I liken this to you're at the supermarket, there's a three-year-old chucking a tantrum because his mum doesn't buy him a kinder surprise and someone comes over and slaps me. I haven't been able to take a trick on my biotech stocks this year. I've had delays. I've had a lack of interest. I've had the NASDAQ biotech index crapping itself. But what I'm doing now for clients is I've found a biotech that I think has multiples in it on future revenue. Now, that's actually revenue. A lot of ASX companies couldn't spell revenue. But what I'm doing is taking risk capital wins and plowing it into that to set my clients up for the next run. And already we've, we've had a few, a few decent runs, but I just think that the effects of long COVID are not yet known. There's going to be stocks that are looking at fibrosis, other medical issues, cholesterol. I know that that can be minimised through diet and exercise. I, I actually found that that program on Spotlight on Mario Fenix, uh, early onset dementia, most interesting. And I think that's going to become a huge issue for sports people involved in contact sport in relation to concussion. Uh, I think uranium, I was involved in the uranium bubble from 2005 really to 2006, and that was absolute madness. It still wasn't as powerful as, as the NASDAQ bubble. I mean, that was the ultimate in, in stupidity. But what you really need to do with uranium, there's not a lot of clear value in that sector. And a lot of those uranium stocks will become, it's simply money flow. Once it becomes hot, that sector becomes overvalued. But as we've seen with a lot of other sectors of the market, you can stay overvalued. And viewers will know that that's the same case with property. So I am looking at ways to make money. I, I should I should be clear. Um, I've been advising for 24 years now. I've, I've seen a lot of calamities in the market. I, I'm of the view that if you find a good small company, you just go for it. I know there's more index risk now, but I try and make it clear that markets can correct from being undervalued. You can go from being undervalued to extremely undervalued. And I hear that there's investors on the sideline waiting for markets to settle. Well, in this day and age, with what we're seeing in the world, it mightn't settle for five to 10 years, or the Dow or S&P 500 mightn't bottom out for five plus years. And to me, I'm 51 now, that's a waste of my life. I am a risk taker. I look to fund mining. I look to fund biotech. I still think there's going to be opportunities. In terms of property, I, I bought a very modest house as shelter. I bought it because we could put a bath in, I could put paintings up on the wall, and I bought it because I saw a cheap five-year fixed rate and I thought, do I pay 40 grand a year to rent competing against 60 other people or do I pay SFA in interest over the five years? And in four years, it's probably time to start worrying. But I guess that's what you've got to look at. I, I treat the stock market as my risk. I, as I said, my property is a place to live. So that, that's the view I take. But I'm not going to stop what I'm doing. I, I saw the dot-com crash. That was ugly. I remember the day the NASDAQ died and it was crickets. You couldn't catch a bid. And what, I, what I'm seeing now in a lot of asset classes, you know, in particular Sydney property, is that you will not be able to catch a bid at the level you expect. Uh, vendors are going to have to start meeting buyers and real estate agents will just thrive on price discovery. So I just think it's um, it's going to get extremely ugly, but that's that's where I think the smart money is headed. There's a lot of value in the biotech sector. I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's more M&A. Already we're seeing massive M&A interest in the copper sector. And I think BHP will have to lift their bid for Oz Minerals. And that just goes to show you the, show you the importance of copper. And especially where you can mine copper in mining-friendly countries, 
where you're not going to get altitude sickness. So here's the dumb money. And what, what can happen when you, when you jump on a bandwagon? So everyone's there jumping on sectors that are running hot and suddenly the bandwagon gets wiped out. I think what crypto has done to society is create, we're just drowning in dopamine and it would become the glo globally and gamblers. That's all the youth are doing is gambling on their mobile phones, trying to buy something in the hope of selling it to a greater idiot. And that, that's a shame that we're going to see young investors wiped out. I already see it on Twitter, on coin fashions, where they've made massive profits, they've lost it all, and they're going to start chasing their losses. And I just see that we've got a generation that want instant gratification. And interestingly, the other bubble, which I think surely will burst, is the affirmation bubble. My, my feed now is dominated by uh, women in bikinis saying good morning, but I'm 100% positive that they would have had to have woken up at 3 a.m. by the time they finished their makeup and Photoshop to actually give a genuine good morning. But I, I can just see huge mental health issues with, with this generation, and that's through showing one's body in the hope of having 2,000 men say you're gorgeous, but... I thought a lot of this shit would have gone down with Fire Festival with those celebrities, influence, influencers swimming with pigs. Obviously not. I think this crypto NFT revolution has brought them out now and there's no reason, you know, obviously it's understandable why OnlyFans gets about $4.8 billion in revenue because all the decent second jobs are taken by people that actually want to work. So anyway, I just see bandwagons being wiped out. I think a lot of investors are going to be tapped out. Long The growth of long-term investors, those willing to fund these operations, is very low. And I've seen that in my client growth. So again, global gamblers, I like to call it. So I think what really is going to get Australia into trouble is cars. Uh, as you can see on the left there, that's a Kia Sportage, perfectly plausible transport. And now on the right, that is the new model. And as you can see, the shape of the cars changed. The entertainment systems have changed. But I'm actually appalled uh, that my son went out and borrowed money over seven years to buy a car that really doesn't fit fit him. He doesn't look like he should be driving that car, to be honest. But, you know, when we start to have that wealth effect, we get what's called delusions of grandeur. I know, I, I feel it, you know, your stocks are running, your house on paper is going up $10,000 a day. And you think, hey, I've got a perfectly good car. I need the newest model. And unless you're this guy, who really needs to upgrade their models as soon as a new model comes out. And I guess as long as they're under now 27 years, but that, that's the issue I see. Australians have a habit of using their Fugazi equity in their houses to go out and buy cars that they don't really need. I don't know who the hell they're trying to impress. I mean, I have a ratio, it's CPW, it's called cost per wow. And I, I, I laugh at that with cars. And I also look at that state.com guy, young kid, 27, who's gone out and spent $110 million on Turak property. If he has 110 people that walk through those doors and say, wow, that's a cost per wow ratio of a million. I just think we're, we've become stupid consumers uh if you buy a car admittedly the used car market short saw some increases if you bought a rav4 you could flip it but once once that ends uh it's hard to get out of a car loan everyone borrows it because they're confident of of future earnings future growth on the houses i just think australians you know we've binged on debt 
it, it's like having a family box at Kentucky and someone suddenly hands you a Zinger burger. You're just absolutely full of debt. And I think it's only going to get worse. So every, everyone would, I hope, I'm hoping everyone would know by now that the Queen has passed away. Uh, my, my grandfather, I guess some people have got their Queen stories. Uh, he bred a horse called Balmerino. So uh, the Queen of Prince Philip uh, visited his start in 1981. I believe the Queen mistakenly signed a visitor book that she shouldn't have. So obviously I don't have that. And there's my mum. Uh, with my late grandfather outside our red brick house in Terry Hills, which I think we was bought for about $114,000. Um, as per the Terry Hills real estate market, is probably now worth about $4 million. But um, anyway, and this there's actually a purpose to this, guys. So just, just prior to my father's death, uh, he he spoke about um, reg a regular visitor, and that regular visitor was Nelson Bunker Hunt. And for those unaware, uh, the Hunt brothers tried to corner the silver market in 1980, and this actually took the price of silver over over fifty dollars an ounce before it collapsed. I think they called it Silver Thursday. So Nelson got himself into a bit of shit. And I believe he was then forced to sell just under $47 million worth of racehorses. And he um, obviously in the racing industry got to meet the Queen. And I can just imagine my grandfather and his stories and what he spoke about with the Queen, their love for horse racing. But what got me was I only just found out that probably the most famous person in silver, uh, Bunker Hunt, uh, was a regular visitor. And I guess the second most famous person in silver was Warren Buffett, when I think he sold all his silver for about $5 an ounce. And that was based on Kodak's moves to digital photography. But again, silver has lots of uses. It's a poor man's gold. But what I like, really, the gold price has been poleaxed, but I think silver's held in there fairly well. So unfortunately, that's what we're faced with. And, and you know, I, I started off with Roger Brown. This this is this is scary shit. Um, I I just can't fathom what what's coming. And I spoke about financial stress. I spoke about divorce. I spoke about bill pressure. I know I've just had a shitload of bills come in all at once. Uh, the government of WA are now off offering us pay by the month car registration. I mean, it's expensive to have a simple life. And what I try and get on with is my steak, Shiraz, and the other S um, sex, which apparently I'm not allowed to talk about. But um, anyway, no, we went out and had our um, third anniversary last night. Uh, once a year, we go to Nobu. We're just grateful for, for what we have. Uh, Melbourne Cup Day. I couldn't think of a better day to drink bottomless verve and just wait for the RBA decision. Yeah, you know, I just think that Australians, hardworking people that don't have the financial literacy of what's provided here are, are being punished because the RBA simply was wrong-footed and now they're fighting, I think, a losing battle against inflation. So what they're doing they're applying a textbook solution to a non-textbook situation, and that spells disaster. I don't see how low and the RBA can balance an economy, a housing bubble, and trying not to tip Australia into, into recession. So I think that's what life's all about. Um, you've got to crawl your way through loads of shit in life to end up on that beach in Waitontaneo. I don't know how to pronounce it, so I just made that up. Andy Dufresne actually crawled through chocolate syrup. But um, yeah, it's it's certainly, there's no precedent for what we're about to see. I think the average Australian family struggling under bills with these rates uh, going up at a record level. We've had five in a row. 
We could peak out at 3.6. We could even get towards 4. But, uh, norm, you know, getting towards being total normalisation is an RBA rate of 6.5% and a yearly mortgage percentage of 9.41%. That's your long-term average, and that that is is frightening. So that's it, Martin. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Very um, uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking. Um, and, and there's a few questions I want to follow up on. But the first one is, bearing in mind that we are facing into something of a gale at the moment with regard to interest rates going up and pretty much all asset classes are actually on the decline, Um do you think we should be thinking about asset protection or should we still be trying to find growth opportunities in, in the middle of the weeds? I mean, how do you, how's, what's the right way to think about it? Oh, look, it depends entirely on your personality. Uh, my, my father, who passed away last year, uh, never bought a share I offered him. And some of them were like, he would have been the, the drum kit on the Beatles. And he, he was very conservative. So he just stuck his money in term deposits, which is fine. Um, if inflation's running at 6%, you're earning 3% on your money. I think that that's fine. But again, you've got the threat. We haven't even got remotely close to a banking crisis yet. If, if you go back to the GFC, where the whole financial system was freezing up, and through my, my experience, since 98, I, I went through the Asian crisis, but the GFC to me is the worst experience I've ever had. It feels like you're being sandpapered to death and choked at the same time. But we haven't seen banks raise money at stupid cheap prices yet. So I, I cannot see the need to go in for yield situations. If you're conservative, all you can do, I, I know this $250,000 bank guarantee is a load of bollocks, <laughs> is spread your money amongst the banks and just wait for it to all pass. Uh, the other option is to buy precious metals. Again, you know, Perth Mint's just been pulled up for potential money laundering. You've got to pay premiums. I actually rang the Perth Mint and they're reasonable prices for a kilo of silver. But do you think you can get a bloody kilo of silver? So, you know, I think precious metals are great for maintaining purchasing power. The BBUS, which I, I put my clients in, has done very well for us. They actually paid a $1.12 dividend. So they've, they've held up quite well. And I, I think that with a bear market, I, you're going to have relief rallies all the way through. And these relief rallies are simply a bull trap. I, I admit, I'm, I'm a speculator. Uh, I believe that I've got a decent whack of BBUS. I've also found companies in the healthcare and mining sector that I believe will get a lot of attention in the copper revolution. Oh, I just love copper. I think that if you can get on the right copper stock, and I've got one biotech company where all my clients that are making huge profits on risk, now these are penny stocks, not for everyone, I'm not going to shill any 10 cent stocks tonight, but what we're doing is taking risk capital wins, Martin, and we're putting it on a biotech stock that I think has got explosive growth over five years. And I don't have a fear of the Dow Jones. I think it's going down. I think we've got at least a 20% correction. But what do I do? Do I wait five to 10 years and my money gets eaten by inflation? So it's all to do with your individual personality. I've met lots of your viewers that have two and a half million dollars in the bank and they're not enjoying their life. They're shit scared of bank bailings. They're scared of what's going to happen. They're scared of having their assets confiscated. I just think you've got to be happy in what you've got. What I suggest when people approach me is to, hey, take a portion of the money you can afford to lose. I will plough ahead with growth opportunities that we'll have along the way. So, again, it get, get, gets back to your personality. I think that's a very important observation, isn't it? Because I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all answer to, to my question, right? And I think it is go, it does go back to what people are comfortable with and what they're most concerned about. Uh, and, um, you know, you can pretty much make an argument for 
well every asset class on the upside and on the downside i mean you know just look at gold for a second right as you said gold is down it's now what 1677 us right having reached a peak of 2075 um previously and um you know there are people out there saying oh you know gold will um sit around this level or maybe even go lower uh, and other people are still saying well gold should be worth about 5000 now to me, the gold question is much more a question about to what extent the um, gold market is actually very much influenced by the derivatives and, uh, you know, the 1 to 50 relationship between the derivatives and the underlying. So as with all of these things, once you start peeling back the onion, I think it gets more complicated. And I'm not sure there are any simple, easy answers at the moment. Hell no. And if you look at any knee reaction in a market overnight, You've got pages on your Twitter feed of charters. They come out, they're saying this, they're saying that, bada bing, bada boom. I mean, look, the, the Dow can fall 3% in a session and it creates madness. If it falls 3% over a month, uh, it's more relaxed. So I'm of the view that gold has always protected your purchasing power. Gold stocks is speculation. I look, I look at cross sections. I look at drilling programs. I know what a million ounces of gold is worth. So why wouldn't I head towards there whilst maintaining? I mean, I like silver. It's a bitch to store. But I think that, you know, as Bunker Hunt tried to do in early 1980, I think silver could have one hell of a run. And for my, my children, that's where you need to dollar cost average. I don't want you doing that in mining companies, in a bank. Uh, you could you could look at an index fund, Martin. I mean, to me, in the indices will fall, but as long as you're buying the indice as it falls, indices always go past their previous highs. I watched a Netflix program on money. Pretty much the moral of the story was cut out your spending, don't spend on unnecessary shit, and buy index funds. So there's thousands of dollars worth of financial advice. Oh, well, let me, let, let me just explore further this, this dollar cost averaging thing, right? Because some yeah. people may not get what we're talking about here, right? This is basically dripping into the market, isn't it, on, on a continuous basis rather than trying to pick the top or the bottom. Yeah, it's sim similar to compounding. So what you'd actually hope for would be a period of flat prices, uh, but you've got to pick an asset class that isn't going to zero. You don't want to have a dollar cost averaging program in a company that goes under, and you don't want to have that program on Australia's worst bank, uh, which I won't name. So I'm of the firm view that gold has been around for 5,000 years. It keeps trading. Uh, gold or silver, if you can find a way to dollar, dollar cost average platinum, e even better. But you have to be selective. And what, what the mainstream advice is in the US is index funds, where you'd buy, say, the ASX 200 uh, ETF, and the index could fall 30 40%, but it will, go, it will head towards 10,000 at one point. So that, that's the conservative way uh, to invest. And when I teach, uh, when I teach kids the market or inexperienced, I, I call that the rhythm section. But again, if you're young, you can take risks. But there's this overwhelming fear of the stock market, and I, I just think you need to be aware of your enemy. And every company is like a community. When when the Dow loses three percent, yes, your stock is going to get sold off by nervous members of your community. But every single small cap company that I've recommended that has the potential and the fundamentals has always delivered, but it just might take a little bit longer. So I, I strongly recommend dollar cost averaging. Uh, earning savings in a, in a bank is, it, you know, it's conservative. Term deposits, why would you want to have your money tied up? I mean, there could be some absolute bargains coming up as well. But I think... Um, a lot out there should really start to get some financial help. I'm, I'm a little bit um, left to center, so to speak. But yeah, that's that's the basis, dollar cost averaging. And I say to my 20-year-old daughter, you're still young when you're 30. 
do not buy a house in East Broken Hill right now because that's where she lives. Dollar cost average with silver, I just hope it doesn't triple so quickly. <laughs> Sorry about that. That was my daughter as we speak. Oh, okay. She must be watching. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah sorry. I forgot to turn my phone volume down. No, that's not, not a problem. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. Uh, now, um, this was an interesting question that came in a little while ago from, from Andrew. Uh, Tony, recent news from Alltech Chemicals. Isn't that a big threat to battery metal producers? Battery, they have battery, battery technology is a massive game changer. Now, I'm not across this. I don't know whether you are, but if you are, I'd be interested to get your views. Yeah, it, it's funny. Um, Iggy Tan, I've followed, I've followed for years. I've, fo I've followed this stock. It's finally hitting its straps now. It was all about um, HPA, which is high purity alumina. But I actually, I actually feel as though that any threats to the EV batteries now, it's going to take some time. Along with hydrogen, I know that they're starting to produce hydrogen cars. But again, there's always going to be substitutes. Uh, what, what viewers and shareholders of some of these lithium companies need to do is look at the market cap and say, well, how much of this is factored in? And there's always going to be threats through new developments, et cetera. They were saying that, um, you know, cobalt, there'll be less uses for cobalt. So I, I think um, there's a picture of Iggy Tan next to persistence in the dictionary. So all tech, yeah, has is certainly fighting its way forward now. But any immediate threat, no, certainly I wouldn't be worried about. But a lot, a lot of these stocks, companies ending with in sectors in IUM, I believe Martin and viewers are massively overpriced. But these are the FOMO magnets uh, that attract all the money flow, and you just got to work out the valuations. But yeah, and no, I certainly want to watch. And what about lithium? Because that's uh, another one that people in the chat have been talking about um, from Stripey Cap, who says uh, lithium has gone down the toilet, I'm, I've heard, and other people um, saying lithium battery prices are about to skyrocket. So there you got you got a polarisation there of uh, the opinion on, on lithium. I, I mean, I, I find it very difficult to try and judge, you know, what the true story is here because there's so much noise about it. It's... That's interesting because I, I look back at 2008 and I was actually involved in the 2008 lithium bubble where there were two stocks, Oracobre and Galaxy, which are now Alchem. We were involved in Kidman Resources, which had, they were drilling for gold. They had an accidental lithium discovery. What, what should be made perfectly clear is that there's 1,400 years supply of lithium on, on the planet. Uh, what's happened, you know, the supply has taken some time to catch up to the demand. We've had a lot of ASX companies in order to attain shareholder value have switched to lithium. I, I look back at some of the stocks and one I missed was Limetown. Uh, I was involved with a guy called Craig Williams who ran Equinox, was one of my favourite stocks of the mid-90s. And he was the director of Limetown, which has pretty much gone from $0.02 cents to $2. But you, you're seeing a lot of risk because these companies are in Argentina. They're miles away from production. And I think the ASX uh, colourful companies are just aware of jumping on the bandwagon. And as you saw during my slideshow, what happens to a bandwagon? So I, I think the sector is overpriced, but it can stay overpriced longer than we can remain solvent. But you have to look at how much good news is already baked into these prices and the multiples they're trading at. It, it's insane. So I do not like the risk reward of the lithium sector. Fair enough. I, I was served the dry chicken breast at the wedding where the person next to me got the ribeye. But I, I teach my clients the lesson that sometimes you've got to sit back and watch others make money. <laughs> right. So sometimes yeah. um, watching other people is, is, a, is a good thing, right, rather than actually trying to uh, just um, make the calls yourself. This is an interesting observation in terms of the way the market works. Um, and, of course, there are a lot of other people who are always looking for those opportunities and looking for, to play those angles. And, and, you know, one of the things you said earlier on, which I want to throw back to you, um, there's a difference between investing and trading, isn't there? 
Um, where do you sort of sit on, on that sort of continuum? Uh, trading is an unhealthy addiction. Uh, when I when I made a fight back in broking, I actually was uh, working with a client day trading. And to me, even though it was hugely profitable and I made shitloads of brokerage, it was too stressful. And we were buying on profit warnings or poor profit reports. So I, I see trading as having a sports bet app, having access to a gaming table. If you, I think people can make a living out of trading if you've got the systems, if you can block out emotion, and you only need to be right half the time to make money. To me, it's far too stressful. How I operate, guys, is we position build. I will identify an undervalued company. I will help fund it. We'll go in and buy between 3 and 15% of the company, and we'll just ride it through. It's like a marriage. You're going to have your, your ups and downs. At some point, you're going to, you're going to have your money halve. I've had a few of my stocks halve this year. Yeah, it sucks. But I am supporting longer-term investment Whereas the majority come in, they fall in love with these hot NFT designers on Twitter. They're shilling all these assets that are worthless. And, and the, as I said, it's just become a pool of dopamine. Uh, a quarter of the youth that are gambling out there on these assets, it's exactly it. And it's hard to turn around. And what I'm cognizant of is keeping my clients mentally fit to hit the home run, to, to get bases loaded, to hit the home run, not to get anxious. Uh, I've had one of my IPOs double and change. It's looking really good. I'm going to have to start ringing clients to say, what do you, whatever you do now is what counts. You've made this money. You know, go back to June this year where we're getting absolutely poleaxed. You killed for a day in the green. Now you've got a triple, quadruple, five-bagger, ten-bagger, and the process of greed repeats itself. So traders, only to the pros, anyone that thinks they can go out and start trading, you know, very few people can do it. Uh, I just think have a, have a proper job, take up golf, and don't look at share prices or asset classes throughout the day. So, no, I hate trading. I would make a lot of money before my clients traded, but life's too short for that shit yeah and it's interesting because when you actually talk to some um let's say less experienced uh, people in the market um uh, you know this this idea of making a quick buck and trying to pick the moves and you know um there was a very good book written a long time ago called the random walk down wall street right and basically they, that concluded after a very detailed analysis that actually on average traders lost as much as they won so it's yeah. actually very difficult to outperform in a trading environment if you if you take a slightly longer view, which which is a really important observation because I'm worried that quite a few youngsters get in and think that trading is investing. Uh, no, no, they're they're punting on. I think there's now nineteen thousand shit coins, which is triple the amount, the triple the number of religions, and everyone is right. So. Me and my partner, every, once a year we go to um, Burswood where Nobu is. I played blackjack for an hour and a half last night. The casino changed the rules where they'll hit on a soft 17. I, it got to the point I was break even. I said to the dealer, look, you win. I've had a gut full of this. And I could tell that the cards were going to change. But what I noticed on that blackjack table was everyone was deflated. They were throwing away money perfect pairs. I mean, you're betting against yourself. And I look at that on asset classes and I think people are just going to put their hands up and say, this is all too hard. I, I give up. I'm just going to keep ignoring all the bills and you you're finished. And that's the society we've, we've become. We want instant gratification. We want to binge everything on Netflix. I mean, I'm guilty of that. But when in society have we had this level of gambling addiction. I, I go back to the dot-com bubble and shares were still relatively unpopular. Now, everyone's talking about crypto and I'm, I'm an old fuddy-duddy because I'm not embracing it. But 
yeah, I can make a lot of money. You can put on a trifecta. I can I can throw a dart at a share price board or crypto. But Jesus, Martin, it's it's not healthy when we're going into the biggest housing correction of our generation and the youth of today are drowning in debt uh, without the fortitude to to build savings and build wealth. Mm, and it's all worth reflecting, isn't it, that the um, whole idea of interest rates going up, which is what's happening at the moment, over the last two decades, almost nobody's seen it, right? So, you know, basically, oh. the, the story has been interest rates always go down, go down, go down, go down. Well, you know, that's now going up. And it's worth just remembering the long term average mortgage rate in Australia is somewhere between six and seven percent. Right. Yep. So so if we go you know, towards that part of the marketplace, that's not an aberration. That's actually normal. So what we've actually seen over the last decade or two is abnormal because of central bank policy and other things. And, and I think a lot of people are now beginning to wake up to the fact that things have really changed. And I don't think central banks are going to be able to pull rates down again, particularly with inflation being so so high at the moment. And with the amount of debt in the system, which means that effectively we're going to find people who have got stranded in, in an environment of ultra low interest rates. And look, I've been preaching, <laughs> preaching this gospel for a long, long time, as you know. And I, keep, I kept saying, it's got to turn, it's got to turn. And of course, the central banks kept taking rates lower and throwing more liquidity in, right? Now we've got quantitative tightening. But the fact is, a lot of people are going to get caught by this. And what I worry is that a whole bunch of people have never actually experienced a lift in interest rates. And the point is, it gets worse and worse and worse, not, not if rates go on going up, but once they've gone up, you have to find it more every month, right? So there's a longevity tail to when rates go up, and I think a lot of people haven't got this yet. Well, it's still going to still going to flow through. And I, I look at my interest payments are around ten thousand dollars a year. If I would have taken out that same loan, my interest payments thirty five thousand dollars a year in interest. So I don't know how a, a work, hardworking family can come up with a hundred thousand dollars post tax to pay off an asset in East Wilcannia that's going to halve in value. Where, where's the economic rationale behind that? What, you know, besides not getting fully educated, what have they done to deserve that? Do they try and sell now and take the loss? I, I probably would. I don't think it's too late to sell. I, I don't think the ship of falls has fully sailed yet. I'm still looking at a lot of these sale prices. Um, Parramatta Eels on Twitter obviously follows these auctions. There's still suckers out there and you just can't. Put your head in the sand. If you're going to sell, you have to go now. And there's no two ways about it. The real estate prices are not going to increase. There's nothing there to fuel it apart from perhaps regional pockets. And once people start returning to the office, uh, these sea change, tree change off a cliff. That that Those purchases, guys, are just like an ego purchase. Because you look at someone that pays $50 million for a house, that's that's ego. But some of these sea change regional houses, it's the same thing. And the percentage declines are going to be just as great. So who would have thought we would have come out, we would have come through a period of COVID, record low interest rates, the mother of all buy now, pay later bubbles, FOMO driven speculative badness, and suddenly we're being panic punished. Um, I, I just I just hate to think of what families are going through. I, I just think you're going to have a huge lift in suicides, divorce, calls to lifeline, uh, partners stuck in relationships where there's lots of gaslighting and violence and stress. I, I hate being under financial stress, and I, I've been there, and it's not it's not a good feeling, but. When you're debt free, you can get through this. But look at the leverage these families have. It's truly frightening. And the rate of interest rate increases, oh, what, we're going to hit six in a row on the 4th of October. Yeah, absolutely. And it could oh. well be 50 basis points again. 
un- un- unbelievable. Yep. And uh, I, yeah. Anyway, I I just worry about I worry about this country. And even though they're starting to look after aged care workers now, then you'll have fire, police, teachers all begging for pay rises. I think childcare workers are the most underappreciated in this country. They're going to have to lift their wages. Pensioners just got a nice pay rise, but they're still going to work out. Do they eat or provide air conditioning when the when the weather gets hot? I, I just I think it's absolutely atrocious with what is happening in society. And again, we're going to have a rush in gambling where families have no other choice but to gamble. I mean, how many jobs can you have? Two to three jobs. I mean, seriously, life is too short for that. And it just happens so quickly. I think a lot of the politicians, the government, are underestimating the social impact of what we're seeing. Because, hey, haven't we had a dream run for, what, about 31 years now? Well, that's right. And quite a few politicians have quite a few properties, interestingly. Well, I think... um, You've got you've got to look at the the downside and what's coming, and you know let let's look at uh, Chris Joy, who's called this brilliantly. I actually enjoy reading what Chris writes. Uh, RBA says fifteen percent off. It's it's simply it's simply unavoidable to steal a line from Robert Palmer, and I think what really shocks me, Martin, is the falls in Brisbane. Um, Again, lots of calls that maybe Bris- with the Olympics coming, Brisbane is bulletproof. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and plant-based bacon is delicious. Not. Well, we we did an anti spruik on video. Thanks to Cookie Boy for that. And, uh, of course, Chris Joy, this this is what he um, put, last put out, right, which basically shows that, um, you know, Brisbane and Melbourne and Sydney all, all going down. And then, of course, he three-month annualises it and talks about Sydney down 22%, Melbourne down 14%, Brisbane down 14%. And it's interesting that Brisbane has, you know, dropped faster, quicker than, than some of the other ones. Um, yes. And it's all because it all goes back to this fundamental point about interest rates, right? And interest rates, if interest rates go up, you can borrow less. And, in fact, the Reserve Bank the other day, um, you know, made the point that... Um, there's a reduction in borrowing capacity, and this is actually a chart from um, a presentation from a couple of days ago. The interesting thing about this chart was that it basically took a, a typical, quote-unquote, joint household disposable income of $150,000 and then used the HEM expenditure measure. Um, but remember that the HEM um, is a bit conservative in terms of what people are actually spending. We most know that most people are spending more, particularly with with sort of top top quartile incomes. So the point is borrowing capacity has come way off. And what that basically means is that you can now get less. And if you can get less, that means you can only pay less, which means that there's no floor to home prices, which is exactly what Joy is saying, which is why he's saying it could be 25%, 30%. And interestingly, that presentation from um, the RBA uh, um, was, was also making the point that um, prices will come down. And if, in fact, they come down and stay down, the theory is that in a couple of years' time, prices will have come down, and that means you'll, have to, you'll need a smaller mortgage, and that means that you can, it's more affordable. So they're actually trying to now weave a story that says, actually, house price falls are good because it will make property more affordable in a couple of years. Um, I'm just worried about the people who are caught on the way through. Yeah, um, it's just insane what, what, we're, what we're going to see. And I, I look at all these prices and even especially the outer western suburbs of Sydney. I mean, every house became a blue chip. It's like... It's like a mining bubble where they've run out of tenements on Earth, so they they go on the moon or they go um, deep sea mining. It's just absolutely incredible. And I look at uh, the Perth market, and that rental crisis is is real. One of one of my best friends is looking for a place to live. He's got one week, and he's competing with fifty to sixty people per home open. Yep. And these houses, they're only average houses, and you're looking at $800 a week, and you think, well, what what happens then? Uh, Families living in cars, couch surfing. So what we've got now is 
multiple crises, and it's everywhere. There's just no pockets of good news unless a family ha has a win. And now, uh, eventually, petrol prices are going to stagger towards that 23 cent per litre increase. So you've got that. I just renewed my car insurance 15% uh, higher than last year. Um, they blame COVID. Cost of living is is rising. Uh, it's just astronomical what, what's happening. And that's, that's putting pressure on every layer of society. And I'm actually going to call this year the year of the onion because every, you know, you just peel it off and it just gets worse. <laughs> it makes your eyes water too. <laughs> oh, my Oh my God! It's it's amazing how how things can can turn around and uh, us. I don't call us bears. I just call us realists. And just it's amazing how things the stupidity can go on for too long. And we have an RBA governor that wasn't taught bond one hundred and one. He didn't look at the bond market, which told him clearly rates were going up. I mean that's just a fundamental mistake. So. Yeah, we're all going to have to pay for it. It's going to affect every single one of us from those on welfare to Andrew Forrest, whose houses are going to fall in value, to the stake.com guy who put $100 million on Turak. That's going to be worth $70 million. So it's going to affect every single one of us. And we've just got to look for ways to defend our financial position. I, I look to defend my position, but, hey, I like to take risks. I like to fund high risk ventures where, you know, in a few years' time, I, I can sit comfortably uh, because my five year fixed rate expires in four years, Martin, <laughs> and I wouldn't have a friggin' clue what rate I'm going to pay. No, fair enough. And uh, I don't know whether you saw this, but um, there was a very good article um, from Dan Ziffer some time ago with the ABC, and he makes, made the point that, you know, how stupid is it that actually my house makes more than I make, right? So I basically over, you know, if you look over the last few years, property prices have gone up and up and up and up and up. And in fact, people have actually made more from just sitting on real estate relative to um, what they've earned. Uh, and, you know, how sustainable is that? Well, we're going to find out, I think, because I think that whole idea of perpetual growth, um, which of course was linked to perpetually lower interest rates, is now all reversing, which essentially means, well, you're going to start losing money you know, month over month over month on the value of the property now. And OK, it's a paper profit, but just as um, when property prices go up, there's, you know, theoretical wealth accumulation. So you feel more wealthy, so you might spend a bit more. When prices come down, the reverse is true. And so you're going to actually spend a lot less simply because, you know, people perhaps will have less. They have to pay more for mortgages and things like that. But also the psychology. And I think the psychology is what really interests me, Tony. And I know that you've got a very specific view about how important the psychology of, of markets actually is. So maybe we can explore that a little bit now. Oh, almost definitely. And, I mean, throughout my career, I've left hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, I've seen profits evaporate. I've been on the top 20 you know, I've floated companies that have gone on to become multi-billion. But where where I see people struggling is owning a house that's gone from half a million dollars to 1.7 and they don't sell and then suddenly that value declines and you, you just go into your shell. You won't go out and spend. You, you won't uh, look to go out and enjoy a meal. You won't take holidays. Uh, you'll... You know, instead of upgrading your car, you'll put a cover on it or you might actually wash the bloody thing. But I think we're going to have a huge sentiment shift in property. And that that is going to be the real breaker where until it's written off totally, it's a bit like an article saying the death of equities. I think that was in about 1979, 1980. Once, once it's totally written off as an asset class, that's when I think it will surely bounce. But I, I know when, I'm un, when I've got a load of bills coming in at once, I feel under pressure. I'm not going to go out and buy new business shirts or new shoes. So I, I think it's going to affect every single family apart from those that are in that ego category where they don't have to worry. They don't have to worry about their power bills coming out of the direct debit. It's going to affect every consumer 
Uh, a lot of pensioners struggle as it is. Those uh, with high mortgages are going to have to work out, well, how do I cover this mortgage? Do I start selling assets? Well, you know, the best time to sell your bar fridge, your freezer or your treadmill has already passed. You know, I one of the quotes, I think a lot of these inspirational quotes on Twitter have the longevity of the male orgasm. But one of the quotes I take away is where I open up my cupboard and they said, well, what you're staring at was formerly cash. So I'm looking at my assets in this house. I've got a few guitars which I could flog off. But cash is king. And I think now is the time that to realise that. But, you know, the time to have that garage sale uh, has, has long passed, Martin. But you've got to look at where can people get the income? Can you send your partner onto OnlyFans for three dollars fifty a month? <laughs> I mean, OnlyFans is flooded with that. Where else do you get your income? Um, do you deliver pizzas for such? That's all taken. I remember during my deepest financial crisis, I was actually rejected for pizza delivery jobs. I mean, what what do you do to get that income? And that's where desperation is going to set in. Do you gamble? Do you go and get financial counselling? Or do you approach Tammy at my budget or do you just put your hands up and say it's all too hard? But I don't think any government or anyone high up has accounted for what's actually coming to Australia. And it's real. We're, we're, we're in it. We're in the economic shitstorm right now because mortgage payments have skyrocketed since April. Absolutely. Well, I was talking to a debt counsel the other day who's um, over in Western Sydney, and uh, she said to me two things. One, they've never had so many people knocking on the door and phoning up trying to actually get help. So you know, more people are seeking help. But secondly, she said, disturbingly, it's getting harder and harder to figure out how to help people because they're in so deep now that essentially, you know, they've done all the obvious things, which is to sort of skinny back their expenditure and, uh, you know, try and, you know, cut up your credit cards and those sorts of things. And what she basically said to me was, we're getting to the point now where we've got this structural debt that's really lurking there. And sure, some people can get another, another job if they're, you know, they've got working over the weekend, but a lot of people are already doing that. So they've got the extra job, they've already cut back, and now the debt, burden is really dragging them down and she said you know I'm, I'm at the end of my tether as to what I can say to them because we are so far down that sl slope now with rates going up and um, you know she's quite fearful because she said there are people who are going to lose their homes it's going to take some time yeah. to work through but that's actually the that's where this is going to take us to and uh, unfortunately I still don't think a lot of the mainstream media and a lot of the, um, you know, the other spookers around are telling the truth about what's really going on. And I just simply underscore, you know, that 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 borrowing scenario where you can borrow 20, 30, 40 percent less than previously is a very good proxy for the problem we've now got. There are too many people who have no way out. And boy, this is going to get from a psychological perspective and from a social perspective that's where it gets serious, and that's what I'm concerned about. Yeah, and I, look, I, I look at it, I remember um, in 2010 where I obviously had delusions of grandeur. I was following Pearl Jam around Europe, and I remember in this cafe in Dublin, and the front page was about negative equity, and that was talking about emergency services people, teachers that simply could not move because they are far too underwater and have to struggle to keep paying. And at what point do you do you give up? Um, so the Celtic Tiger crashed long before that, and you've still got all that pain to flow. And I look at um, suburbs uh, north of Perth or South Broome, where there's estates of new houses. You can tell them where a lot of these purchases are on Keystar. They're on these low start loans that are going to be in a world of pain. So, look, I don't think the situation, there's no soft landing here. Uh, again, that that's an, a soft landing is a big oxymoron than a very happy marriage. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy, Martin, but anyway. But um, I just don't think you can underestimate what's coming. 
And all I can do as a content as a content provider is say, wait a sec, okay, we know this is bad, we know, but there's going to be opportunities, and the smart people out there that are financially literate can profit from what's coming, and you shouldn't feel ashamed at all, because it's every family for themselves now. And you you watch, I mean, um, the easiest way to lose a friend is to lend them money. So um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's true, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and particularly now. And, and what I'm interested in also, and I see this in my surveys, that um, when people get into difficulty, the first thing they do is to get more debt. I don't know whether it's credit card debt or buy now pay later and of course the buy now pay later companies have crashed in price guess what because the the bad debts are, go, are going up um and again back going back to the conversation with with the debt counselor she said she was amazed at how many people have actually gone for the buy now pay later route to try and sort of magic their way out but of course all you're doing is just shifting payments you're not actually changing your behavior and, and i just worry about whether in fact people understand what needs to change from a behavioral perspective to be able to get this under control because you it's not business as normal or business as it as the normal was then there has to be a new normal now oh oh absolutely and you look at the those that took took the money out of super uh, as well i mean what what's happened and they probably honestly didn't need it but they may have spent that on gambling or a new wardrobe or any other depreciating assets may have upgraded their boat or added some new flat screens to the man cave. But again, we just simply do not have the literacy. We are a nation of gamblers. We love to binge on debt. I, I know, I know, I was there. Um, I was on a just a reasonable uh, wage salary for eight years. I, I had a mild addiction to gambling. I also used to play poker machines. I, you know, I smoked in my earlier years. I mean, sometimes you just live from that pay to pay and it's not, it's not easy. And being middle class is actually bloody expensive. <laughs> and I look at the air conditioning, you look at all the lights, but what, what I've learned is a big house doesn't make you happy. A flash car doesn't doesn't make you happy you've got to look at what sparks joy and the heat maps will show that we hardly utilize the space in our houses and a big house to me is just uh, you know a pain in the ass and i look at robbie williams um who's going to be doing the afl grand final and he spoke up about having a 13 bedroom nine bathroom house you what you have to do to enjoy life have no or little stress is to pitch your way of living just below your means and it's taken me 51 years to work that out martin because <laughs> stuff it i mean when, when you're flying high when i've got a stock that's going through the roof i'll walk past an old house and think how many townhouses can i put on that block of land but i feel that but i'm not going to act on it so i think that's what i've learned is to not to act on this delusion, these delusions I have when I start to feel wealthy. And when you start to feel wealthy, your behavior, you get a bit loose. Yeah, you, know, you start, you go to the bottle shop, you'll buy Verve instead of Jacob's Creek. <laughs> you know, you enjoy life and you spend, don't you? We all spend once we feel good. And it's like, it's like when you meet your partner for the first time. It's a major dopamine hit and you feel great. And that is the wealth effect. And that is going to wear off. And I don't know how the puppeteer can organise something that resembles a soft landing because right now we've had probably one of the shittiest years I can remember. Uh, you look at the economy, you look at where we're heading socially. I look at some of my heroes that have died. Uh, you go through all the mourning, et cetera, and we're only towards the end of September. So, you know, I guess the key is for viewers that obviously, um, you know, they've been well educated, you've educated them brilliantly. Um, I mean, I love the shows you do with Tarek. I sit there on an exercise bike and I, I just love the content and I love what you're, what you're providing. And I just think that there are, 
There are stories behind these charts, Martin, mm -hmm. and I, I feel these stories. I don't act on them, but I go back to, you know, when things get tough, I go into survival mode. I say, well, how can I better myself? How can I increase my income ethically without and operating my client's best interests? And that is to work more efficiently. Um, you know, every morning now I brew a pot of herb tea. Yes, I've become addicted to her her herbal tea. I'm doing the 16-8 and I'll go to the gym six days a week now because I need to be right mentally because I know what's coming and I've got to sit there. Some days I get three phone calls, other days 100, and my client's stress is being mirrored onto me and I've just got to be mentally fit for that and I'm just absolutely petrified as to where a fair chunk of our population is heading mentally if they're not already screwed. Yeah. Well, you know, I mentioned the social consequences, and that's the thing that I'm concerned about because, you know, debt is a problem in its own right, but it turns into a bunch of other things too, and, and those can have real social consequences. And, you know, if you look at some of the postcodes with the high levels of stress, you already see some criminal tendencies merging, some crime statistics going up, all of those things. And the, the point is there are real-world consequences to this frank, frankly stupid approach that we've had over the last 20 years of just taking rates lower and lower and lower and stoking more and more debt on everybody, right? I have to say that I think the people who actually drove that, which was the politicians and the, and the regulators and the Reserve Bank, um, are getting away scot-free. But unfortunately, the social consequences are hitting real people. And that's another issue that I'm you know, trying to highlight because there are consequences in what, what's happened. Yeah, and you know, I look at your mortgage stress chart, and I think what you, you'd be close to an all-time high, if not yep. at an all-time high now. Never been higher. Yep. And that you know, but yet we've got to be concerned. Uh, all all I can do is do my best to teach my kids as to now now don't don't rush into it. Dollar cost average. Put your money. Get an account. Dollar cost average. Silver. I'll help you with an ETF. I'll also give you, I'm going to give you my best stock idea, which is risky, but has growth. So buy some of that. And hopefully I'll live long enough to tell them when to pull the trigger on, on a house, because I'm pretty sure there's going to be a great time to buy. And, and, you know, I saw that in Perth in 2000. I went out, I thought I was a property entrepreneur. But what happened, my income from the stock market uh, dwindled away, so I had to I had to backpedal and sell these properties. And where I made my mistake was I bought properties and put my family in them to look after them. They weren't smart financial decisions, but I, I certainly was fortunate enough to get out of jail. But there, there are going to be these opportunities that will come. Uh, the situation isn't totally hopeless, but I'm going to plough my way through it. As I, I'll make perfectly clear, I, I take educated risks. Uh, savings accounts, buying bank shares bores me. I, I think bank shares still are at amazing levels. Our market is not that far off all-time highs. Uh, we've only seen a small dip relative to where we've come from in a lot of assets. And it's still not too late to sell, but the majority will see a price peak. Let's just say 1.7, and they'll think that they don't want to sell at 1.65 because they want it to get back to 1.7. And that will reverberate through every bloody asset class. And that's where you have to be, you have to be mentally strong to be able to pull the trigger. And I've seen market collapses. Um, you have to have the courage to act. You have you just got to call it. And I, I look at some of my biotech stocks this year, which are great companies. They're making advances in cancer, brain tumour diagnostics, but they've halved. And if you need to sell, you have to sell at half the price. And the crowd, the sentiment has turned negative and the same is going to happen to property and, you know, as I said, once one agent gets whiff of a lower price, he or she will come to you and present sales evidence, price discovery, and suddenly you look at it and say, well, we're taking a $200,000 discount on that, that house nearby. 
but you're, they're not going to sell. They're going to stick their head in the sand. And I think that that's the problem where we've we've had 30-odd years of a pretty easy economy. We've had rates that got fairly high before the GFC, and now 0.1 of a percent. Can you believe that, Martin? <laughs> can you believe it? And well I did. I did. I did like. say. I did say when it got down to zero point one percent. Yeah, we'll never see those rates again, right? I remember saying at the time, you know, fix fix rates, you know, two percent or just over. Right? Those are remarkable rates. You know, go go for your life because the yeah. chances are you'll never see them again. Um, and and some did. You know, you did. So so it's interesting yeah. how how some some but many didn't and, and uh, of course they're caught now now um jason asked an interesting question which um i just want to cycle back around to he said um thanks for the super chat also jason greatly appreciated do you think companies like zip or other buy now pay later companies are going to end up failing in the future when people can't afford to pay them back and if so in what time frame of course that prices have really come down um i'll give you a bit of intelligence from my yeah. side and that is that um we're seeing the typical buy now pay later exposure from the households in difficulty expanding and we're seeing a greater proportion of people now paying penalties because they can't actually pay back so they do actually make more money from the penalties from people who are actually being forced to pay but there's an interesting question as to whether the buy now pay later model is actually one that has got any future what do you think oh look it, it goes back to the days where i used to buy tarot cash and it had the afterpay stickers on the back of the change room <laughs> and the you know the share price what went 30 times since then and you look at zip uh you look at um uh Cezzle, uh they all had these major recoveries i, I think on the back of on the back of day trading, I don't. What, what else? What do they, do they diversify into? For God's sake! Um, <laughs> well, I, they're, I they're trying that, to become more sophisticated financial services companies, right? Well, uh, but what are they there for? Well, is I, I guess my question. Well, that you know, you look at what the CBA are now offering. Mm. So I, I just think it's going to be a death by a thousand cuts, and I, I look at companies that delivered boxes full of ingredients to cook isn't that called a friggin supermarket <laughs> and and you pull up a chart of marley spoon triple m um all these delivery businesses um that that was that was a bubble now you go to the shops uh, or you buy these ready meals so i'm not i'm not bullish on that that buy now pay later sector at all and i think money flows going to go elsewhere but um, who, who would have thought that that could have, it was FOMO-driven stupidity. So would I touch those stocks? No, they'll be good for a day trade. Um, I've watched some stocks that are trading on the ASX that have no nothing behind them, but traders will come in and they'll, they'll play with them. So from a trading perspective, yes, investment class, hell no. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, I just wanted to come and cycle back round on one other thing you mentioned, silver earlier on, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And just put the silver chart up because I've got it up on the screen. So it's the moment sitting at 1935. This is the US, yeah, uh, 1935. And it's interesting, of course, because back in 2011, it hit a peak of uh, 47 or just over. Um, but it's been languishing and continues to languish. And it sort of follows gold to a lesser or greater extent. Now, you, 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 I think, earlier on said, you know, gold versus silver. Actually, maybe silver is actually a better bet than, than gold. Can we just unpack that slightly more? Because I thought that was an interesting observation. Yeah, I think, I think in the near term, silver has certainly been stronger um, than gold. And what we're seeing on uh, Twitter, Reddit, is silver squeeze coming back. So these online... Crusaders think that they're going to try and squeeze the silver market uh, to what the Hunt brothers did. But I, I look at uh, base metals, precious metals that could become FOMO driven. And who would have thought that coal and iron ore would have become sexy? I mean, these prices went absolutely through the roof. And I think silver's been around for thousands of years. I think it's an ideal asset class to dollar cost average. And I think once there is a drive towards it, I think we could see a viable silver bubble 
and momentum and hopefully multiples from here. So, you know, I, I still like uranium. I just can't find deep value in uranium stocks. So the uranium stocks become money value. It's money driven plays or you get on the discovery phase. But um, to me, silver is something you could build a sizable holding in and away, away she goes. And it's always hard to predict bubbles when you're not in one. So yeah, my favorite, my favorite base metal commodity by a mile. There's limited limited investment opportunities on the ASX. So it's a, it's a sector that could fly, but looking elsewhere, what else could become popular? Um, platinum's been poleaxed. All these EV metal stocks are, are pretty much overpriced. All the good news is baked in. Long COVID, look, look at the biotech sector. I'm just going to focus on companies where I can value the entire business on the back of an envelope and have confidence to invest. And, and that's what we're doing. But again, I've got to look at, you know, what's a safe asset? Do you have your money in the bank? Do you buy? What do you invest in that's going to stick around? And to me, precious metals, whilst they're going to be volatile, is the ideal sector. So last question for tonight, um, yeah. Tony. Um, you know, we expect interest rates to continue to rise. Um, probably stock markets will continue to fall. Now, earlier on, you talked about the BBUS, which effectively is a is an inverse um, hedge relationship, isn't it? So yeah, sure. it might be yeah. just exploring that just slightly more for people because they may not have might not have come across this. So it's a it's a US index that is an inverse of the um, of the US market. Yeah, so, so how it works, obviously um, get in touch with your financial advisor, but um, Better Shares offer this ETF. Um, I've been to a couple of their luncheons and I get their emails. I, I think Better Shares is a great organisation. So how, how it works is it trades openly on the stock market. You can't see the market depth, but for every 1% fall in the S&P 500, this ETF is expected to increase uh, by two and a quarter percent to two and three quarter of a percent. So that's how it works. If the S&P trades down a couple of percent, you're going to see that trade four and a half percent plus. But what really knocked my clients out was this surprise dollar twelve dividend we got, <laughs> which um, you know I. I struggle. I try my hardest not to get dividends, and I ended up getting one. So uh, the better shares, they were returning futures profits. So how they hedge the S&P 500 position, which is actually 505 companies, is based on futures trading, and they decided to return that to holders of the BBUS. So if you look at the chart of the BBUS since about uh, 2015, 2016, it looks extremely ugly um, because the markets have roared ahead and that that's dropped. But I, I suggest to my clients, as we're speculators, to have 10% of your wealth in one of these instruments, which is the BBUS or the BBOZ, which tracks the ASX 200. Um, for those extreme sports people, there is an ETF out there called the SNAS which is Sierra, November, Alpha, Sierra, which tracks the NASDAQ, which is extremely volatile. So I, I think these instruments are certainly worthwhile, but, geez, you need to get some advice. But if you've got a risk portfolio and the market goes the other way, it, it melts up, I still think that having that insurance is certainly worthwhile. And... The, the struggle I have is when there is a bear market or relief rally, my clients think, well, I feel kind of stupid now, but ever since stock markets were around, in a lower trending market, you're going to have powerful rallies the other way, which is essentially known as a uh, as a bull trap. Absolutely. And that, of course, is... It. <laughs> 
who knows what's going to happen. Well, Tanya, I found that a very interesting conversation. Thanks again, and uh, congratulations on your uh, up updated presentation style. But the good news is you still managed to tick most of the um, the, the bingo calls, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, I think. Look, I'll, I'll be honest. I think this is probably one of our one of our more important discussions. But um, hopefully, I get invited back to give you my um, two thousand and twenty three less shitty market outlook. Well, I look forward to that, Tony. I, before you go, I just tell you that um, I did ask a question in the chat before people started, um, and the question was, what, as what as which asset classes are going to fall the mass over the next twelve months, right? And so the poll said, property thirty nine percent, shares and bonds twenty eight percent, metals four percent, and crypto thirty percent. So I would say that there's quite a lot of um, different views as to you know where where the falls are going to go of the four where do you think the biggest is, is going to be across property shares bonds metal and crypto from where we are now over the next year wow wow um are we going to base this on uh bitcoin well it's the biggest isn't it yeah i'm, I'm gonna go i'm gonna go crypto uh in in the slide hope that this uh eastern states property collapse happens a little bit slower and that it gives people time to, to get the hell out adjust but um to me you know you, you're looking at these cryptocurrencies that are controlled by whales who can pretty much send the prices where they want um apart from sailor who who struggles to chart his own course <laughs> yeah well indeed that's exactly right okay tanya well that's very interesting and um i think uh, my, my take out from um the fact that there's a lot of uh, you know views that are spread across different asset classes highlights the complexity that we're in right and i don't know about you i have never seen a market that is more complex and more difficult to navigate and more uncertain than than, than we got at the moment so there are very few eternal certainties other than there's more uncertainty <laughs> it's the way I think about it. Exactly. And I've never I've never seen a period in markets where everyone is universally negative. Mm. So if you're a contrarian, you know, you're certainly brave, but but who knows? This bearishness is, is off the friggin' charts. So anyway, um I'm eternally grateful for all the content uh you provide. And uh, I look forward to all the programs and I hope viewers have got something out of tonight. Well, thank you, Tony. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll have you back on later in the year and get your uh, ideas for uh, for next year, which, as you say, hopefully will be a little less uh, frenetic than this one. But uh, thanks very much. Have a good evening. I'm going to take you off for line and I'll close the show. See you later. Thank you. So there you go. That was uh, Tony in full flight, and um, I pretty much got the full score from the, the bingo cards. I hope you did too. And uh, just before I go, I just should tell you that next week I've got Damien Classen coming on. He's going to talk about um, what he's seeing from an investment perspective, which will be an interesting conversation. Particularly, of course, that'll be after all of the central banks around the world have announced more rate hikes, and before we um, have the uh, RBA lifting in October. Um, 25 or 50 or something else will be the interesting discussion point there. So I want to say thank you very much for spending some time with us this evening. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please like the show if you haven't done so already. And uh, check the live next week on Tuesday, but also check the recorded shows in the uh, meantime. We put shows up pretty much every day. This is Marley North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. Cheerio.